For all panel members, I'd ask you to listen to this question, analyze it, and then answer. In Gwynn versus Nevada Legislature in 2003, the Nevada Supreme Court granted a writ of mandate to the governor, ordering the Nevada Legislature to proceed uh, in providing and creating sources of revenue for educational funding by a majority vote rather than by a two-thirds majority as was required by the Nevada Constitution. Do you agree or disagree with the court's analysis and why? Mark? Well, first, David, this is Mark Rissman, Department 31, and uh, before I answer the question, I was wondering if, as old friends, you'd consider supporting the third candidate. <laughs> the third candidate. Um, I, I would have to say uh, on two levels, uh, although as district court judges we are required to uh, observe what they call star decisis and uh, respect and preserve the prior decisions of our Supreme Court. I think the voters spoke very loudly and very clearly uh, when several of the justices who were on that court either resigned or were voted out of office. Uh, I think if that decision had been taken to a higher level, uh, or if there was a higher court that it could have been heard, I think the Constitution of this state would have prevailed over the activist opinion of those judges who are now out of office. This is Joanna Kishner for Department 31. Mr. Rivers, I'd love to have your support as well so that you have equally for all <laughs> candidates running for Department 31. Um, with respect to your question, you raise a very serious issue. You're basically taking the issue of between what the voters have stated that they wish to be versus the Nevada Supreme Court. Um, like Mr. Rissman, I mean, it, it raises some challenges because I think that the voters have clearly spoken. And I think that the idea that this could have been appealed further, depending on funding and the determination at that time, there is a need to fund education. And I think that that was clearly the mandate. And I think that the way that the court ruled on that is probably going to come up at a later time. And I would like to be a little bit careful about that because depending on how that comes up, as you're fully aware, I can see you nodding, is that we as judicial candidates may have to be a little bit careful there in saying how we might rule because that very issue is likely to come squarely within, I'd say, the next couple of years before one of us likely, if you look at the breadth and depth of civil litigation, that these seven new judge seats are going to be created. Thank you. Phil Dabney for Department 31. Mr. Rivers, thank you for your support. Um, I, uh, it's a very difficult uh, question to answer because I think the Supreme Court, in a very controversial way, resolved a very important issue that probably uh, delayed the impact of uh, our taxation system until what we're facing today. And of course, uh, uh, many argue that what the Supreme Court did was uh, substitute its judgment for that of the legislature. And that's not the job of a judge. The job of a judge is to analyze a set of facts and apply the law to those set of facts and make a reasonable decision or a reasoned decision based upon the law. Um, and of course, the appellate courts uh, have a different standard than the district courts do. Uh, so um, I, I can't say that I agree with the way the Supreme Court went about making that decision. Um, I would hope that uh, we as a state can figure out a way to solve our budgetary crisis in a manner that doesn't require the Supreme Court to be involved. Thank you. Josh Kunis again. Um, I think for me as an attorney and as an American citizen, there's nothing more important than the Constitution to me in terms of all laws. I mean, obviously my family is more important but in some level. But, um, and I think that you follow the Constitution and the Nevada Supreme Court did not do that in that 2003 decision. So I disagree with it. Um, I also would point out that as district court judges, our role is to apply the law fairly and objectively. It's not our job to make laws. As Mr. Dadney said, that's up to the legislature. So um, I, I guess, luckily, whoever wins this seat isn't gonna have to deal with those kinds of appellate issues. But clearly, unless a law that is passed is unconstitutional in its face, the Constitution always takes precedence. In, in my own defense, uh, I too went to law school at the age of 33, and I find myself to be almost twice that age now, so perhaps I can be forgiven. <laughs> uh, 
Before you start, Travis, uh, if we could just uh, make sure that uh, comments are kept to uh, one minute, one minute from here on out. Uh, we do have a full docket as well, so uh, if you can, Travis. Thank you. I'm going to give you a hypothetical. Uh, you're sitting on the bench, and um, a criminal matter comes up. There's a motion to quash a felony fugitive warrant, felony warrant for violation of a parole or probation. And that motion to quash is filed on behalf of a veteran in another jurisdiction who is receiving treatment from a VA funded facility. And the VA has informed that veteran that unless that warrant is quashed, they will no longer be eligible for treatment benefits. The motion comes before you, the district attorney is demanding that the motion to quash be denied, that the veteran be brought back to Nevada to face the consequences of violating their pro terms of their probation. Uh, it's not a murder. It's something less than a murder. So you might have heard this question from posed to the previous panel. Give us a brief analysis. Well, let me ask you this. Are there circumstances under which you would grant the motion to, to quash, and what would those circumstances be? Mark Risman, Department 31, um, and I, I just want to thank Nick for those comments, and hopefully my responses have come within under the minute, and that will be how we'll move the cases along in Department 31 also. Um, <coughs> first, uh, with all due respect, uh, Mr. Barrick, nobody in this panel will ever have to face that question, at least as the way these seats are created now. They are strictly civil. There will be no criminal issues before us, no construction defect issues before us, or family court members before us. Um, there, there are some lines between jaywalking and rape that obviously would pay, play a big effect if that matter were before me. But I, I certainly would have to say that if somebody served his country and earned the benefits and had the chips on the table that Mike Davidson referred to in the prior panel, uh, I would do give every consideration possible for, to the service that veteran don't, gave to his country, the need for the treatment, the serious nature of the treatment, the availability of the treatment, and I would take my time before that hearing and also utilize the time of the clerical staff and law clerk that we are given to try to find a solution. And I would even call both defense counsel and the DA into chambers before that hearing to see if something could be worked out before it went on the record and a decision had to be made. 